everybody, welcome back to another episode of Drug Talk. As always, I'm your host, Garrett Campbell. Today we're going to be talking about a medication known as Adalimumab. Its brand name is Humira. Now before I talk about the medication itself, just keep in mind that this channel is for information purposes only and not to be used as a source for recommendations for your personal health care. So Adalimumab binds specifically to tumor necrosis factor alpha and it blocks its interaction with P55 and P75 cell surface receptors. These receptors would be specific to TNF. Adalimumab does not bind to or inactivate lymphotoxin, which would be TNF beta. Adalimumab also modulates biological responses that are induced or regulated by tumor necrosis factor. This would include changes in levels of adhesion molecules that are responsible for leukocyte migration. And finally, adalimumab decreases C-reactive protein, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, and matrix metalloproteinases. There are many different situations when we see this medication used, so I'll go over some of the indications here with you now. It can be used to treat ankylosing spondylitis. We see it used in moderate to severe Crohn's disease. This would be reserved for patients who have had inadequate responses from conventional therapies. It can be used to treat hidradenitis supportiva in moderate or severe cases. Juvenile idiopathic arthritis can be treated with Humira. Moderate or severe chronic plaque psoriasis can also be treated with adalimumab. Psoriatic arthritis as well as rheumatoid arthritis may also be treated with this medication in moderate or severe cases. Active moderate or severe ulcerative colitis can be treated with adalimumab. And finally, uveitis can be treated with this medication. Now, before somebody was prescribed adalimumab, there are some warnings and precautions that they should be made aware of. New onset, as well as worsening of congestive heart failure, has been reported by patients who use adalimumab. Adalimumab cannot be used with abatacept or anakinra, as well as live vaccines. Melanoma, as well as non-melanoma skin cancers have been reported. Hematological abnormalities have been reported and they may result in the discontinuation of therapy. Serious and sometimes fatal infections have been reported with the use of adalimumab. Patients would be at an increased risk of experiencing these infections if they are immunocompromised or if they are above the age of 65. Pediatric patients should be brought up to speed on all of their immunizations before they start using adalimumab. Autoantibody formation may occur, and this may turn into something that resembles lupus-like syndrome. If somebody has an active infection, this would include a localized infection, they should stop adalimumab. And also, if somebody is not yet using the medication, they should wait until the infection clears before starting it. It must be used cautiously in patients with a history of opportunistic infections. This would also count for patients who have underlying conditions which would predispose them to an infection. Anaphylaxis as well as angioedema have both been reported with adalimumab. Malignancies have been reported in adults. An interesting note here is that healthcare professionals have to use caution when they're immunizing infants who have been exposed to adalimumab in utero. And the last thing to note here is just that for patients who may have a latex allergy, the gray cover that goes over the 27 gauge needle does contain latex. Now, once somebody is made aware of the precautions and warnings and they start using adalimumab, they can expect to take it in different doses depending on the reason that they've been prescribed it. In ankylosing spondylitis, the typical dose would be given subcutaneously at 40 milligrams once every other week. If people are using adalimumab to treat Crohn's disease, they would start off with a dose of 160 milligrams taken subcutaneously. Some patients do choose to take this day one dose and split it up over two days. And then two weeks later, on day 15, they would use 80 milligrams subcutaneously. And then 40 milligrams subcutaneously would be given every other week, starting on day 29. When treating plaque psoriasis, the typical starting dose here would be 80 milligrams subcutaneously. And then they would be using 40 milligrams subcutaneously every other week, but they would start this seven days after their first dose. In rheumatoid arthritis, the typical dose would be 40 milligrams subcutaneously every other week, but these patients do have the option to increase their dosing to take 40 milligrams every week. Only patients that are not also using methotrexate can increase the frequency to weekly. 
Now, as with all medications, there are some adverse reactions or side effects that people may experience while using adalimumab. So I'll go over some of those here for you now. Six to 19% of patients experience pain at the injection site. Injection site reactions happen five to 20% of the time. Rash happens 12% of the time. About 12% of patients experience a headache and 11% develop sinusitis. 17% experience upper respiratory tract infections. I'm going to list off a few cardiovascular side effects now that are possibilities with this medication. Each of these side effects happens less than 5% of the time. Atrial fibrillation, cardiac arrest, chest pain, congestive heart failure, myocardial infarction, syncope, pericarditis, and finally pericardial effusion. Moving on now, dermatological side effects. Patients may experience Steven Johnson syndrome. In their gastrointestinal tract, they may experience a hemorrhage. A granulocytosis, as well as leukopenia, are both possible, but they are rare. Bone necrosis happens less than 5% of the time. Also less than 5% of the time, patients may experience a subdural hematoma. And finally, difficulty breathing and bronchospasm may also happen to patients. The development of an infectious disease would be considered a side effect. However, because it's so common with this medication, it's better just to tell all patients to watch out for any signs of infection and to report them to their physician as soon as they do notice them. That's all we're going to talk about today with adalimumab or Humira. As always, I'm thankful that you took the time to combine and watch one of my videos. If you found the information valuable and you'd like to help me grow this channel, you can like the videos, share the videos, or most importantly, subscribe to the YouTube channel. There's also some links in the description you can check out as well. That's it for today. Take care.